Okay, so, uh, well, welcome, everybody. Well, uh, we've already got our first candidate up on the screen, but it looks like he's uh, just got some good news from Philadelphia or Palo Alto. Um, my name is Matt, <laughs> I'm one of the co-founders and directors of uh, Fortuna Admissions, and I'm very much looking forward to this session uh, with many of you that have sent in uh, your profiles for the committee. And the idea of the committee uh, is, of course, in each of those phases of assessment uh, at the business schools, the world's top business schools, um, there's a lot of discussion. We're talking about the data points of GPA and GMAT and what people have done, not just on their professional fast track, uh, but how they have stood out through extracurriculars, community engagement. Um, so uh, let's take a look at some of the, uh, the goals of um, of today's session. Um, Fortuna, as, as you probably know, um, when we got started seven or eight years ago, there were lots and lots of these admission firms out there, but there didn't seem to be any admissions officers. And the sort of admissions officers that would have um, sort of squirreled themselves away for these lengthy discussions about private equity analysts and strategy consultants and software engineers. So we've built our entire team around uh, admissions experience uh, and now have uh, former directors and associate directors from 12 of the top 15 schools. We've got a sense of the list of top US and European schools. Uh, and with that, I think the sort of um, very honest, uh, very informed advice that we would like to share with all of you as we assess the different profiles uh, that, that you've shared for today's committee session. Uh, of course, if you want to go to the next stage of uh, in-depth discussion, you know, please do contact us through the website and we'll set up a call with you. But today's experts, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Cassandra. Cassandra's joining us, uh, you just dialed in from, from London. Um, as well as being a Columbia MBA, uh, Cassandra was a member of the admissions team at both the London Business School and INSEAD. So Cassandra, you're our European specialist for today's committee and we have a fair number of uh, the profiles looking at top European schools. Uh, also with us, Heidi Hillis, who um, is a Stanford GSB alum. I think you just had a great reunion back in Palo Alto, ju judging by some of the photos. We did, 20 years. <laughs> 20, 20 years, there you go. And uh, of course, during that time, since leaving the school, uh, playing a role as one of the MBA admissions interviewers for those lucky few that have given uh, a GSB uh, invite to interview. Uh, and finally, Michelle Belden, uh, who woke up earlier than any of us, I think, felt to, to join this session. Um, Michelle spent years at, uh, at the Wharton School and was the former Associate Director of Admissions. So as you can see, a true committee uh, and uh, the sort of discussions that that will lead to. So I think uh, the first profile <coughs> that we'll send in, <coughs> as you'll see as we go through these six and seven profiles today, uh, looking at the target schools, different things that we see in their backgrounds, um, and the sort of advice and assessment that we've promised for this session. So we'll start with Mohit. Mohit is looking at um, three of the top US schools, M7 schools, Stanford, Harvard, and MIT Sloan. Uh, Mohit is uh, based out of Delhi uh, and uh, is, has an entrepreneurial edge to him, having founded his own ed tech startup. Um, and by the time uh, he joins business school, he'll have seven years of experience. Uh, obviously, that sort of ed tech uh, fits into his post MBA career goals uh, as he looks to then take his company to the next level. He spent, spent part of his academic background at, uh, at SUNY uh, studying computer science, has very strong uh, GPA and a GMAT that I think will be part of uh, greater discussion. So, uh, Heidi, I'm going to get uh, started with you um, changing lives, changing organizations and changing the world at Stanford. Um, what, uh, what did you see in, uh, in Mohit's profile? Well, let's see, there's a few things. I mean, I think, you know, when you first start out saying you're a founder of a company, sometimes that seems a bit, you know, you, there's so many different types of companies. And, and so that first gave me pause. But when I look at his resume, I mean, he does have a really good, um, solid background, some really blue chip firms into it, LinkedIn. So it kind of becomes more believable, that whole um, entrepreneurial story that he has that background. I mean, he is coming from a really um, tough bucket, I would say, which is an Indian um, engineer, but he has had some really kind of interesting experience and that some serious kind of, you know, he's got some patents going on, pending. Um, so all these things kind of come together to say this is kind of an, a more interesting profile that I would have thought at first glance. Um, the GMAT is giving me pause um, here, and I think that that's something we can discuss. I mean, you know, we know that Stanford is has a quite high GMAT, and especially in this demographic. So 
he's going to have to really um, work at, you know, convincing us that, that that's not an issue, especially the quant. Um, I'd be interested to see what, what Cassandra and Michelle thought about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty low quant. It sounds like he's planning to take it again, which I think is a good idea. Um, and I mean, I guess, you know, seven years is, is a little bit on the, on the older side, more experience um, than most. So he's going to really have to convince me that he, um, you know, he knows what he wants at this stage and why he's doing it. The, the, the argument of why he's doing this is going to be really important. Right. Uh, just starting with that point, Heidi, and perhaps Michelle bring you in on this one, the idea of sort of starting your own business, um, which takes on um, important perhaps to sort of frame that, give a sense of scale, put some numbers to uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, what Mohit has been able to achieve with this ed tech startup in the last, um, in recent years. And also possibly if he had a previous employer that was one of the bigger uh, IT players, how he then sort of contrasts his ability to thrive in that corporate environment, and then presumably the sort of skill sets that he's then needed uh, to get an ed tech startup off the ground. Right, and I agree with Heidi that I want to understand his story and why now is the right time to apply to business school. <clears throat> Excuse me, with his startup to you know take that time to step away. Can he do that? What does that look like? Um, to really have a compelling story. Um, although I do agree, I think his background is interesting, um, and now starting his own company, what that looks like. Um, but um, I also agree that the GMAT is a little bit low um, and definitely needs to come up if he wants to be competitive at those schools that he has listed. Right, we've seen we've seen this sort of arms race for GMAT schools. I know that Stanford is just now trying to step back from that record 737 level, and the incoming class is at 732, but they're joined at that point by Kellogg, Wharton, Columbia, all with a 732 average. Um, it, it, do schools just look at GMAT scores related to the overall pool? Or, you know, you'd sort of said, well, you know, here's, here's a well-represented profile, the, the Indian sort of computer background. Uh, do you think their expectations, Cassandra, do you think uh, school expectations on the GMAT are even higher for either certain professional profiles or certain demographics from around the world? I, I think that in all honesty, yeah, you're always, you're always um, compared to your peer group. And, you know, what we do see, you know, from India particular, uh, in particular and in a lot of countries in Asia is that the, the GMAT just tends to be higher. Um, and so we, we tend to expect more from, um, from Indian applicants and from applicants from those countries where they, they have demonstrated that they have the resources or that their education system is, is supportive of taking these standardized tests. Um, I will say that if, um, if Mohit were to come to, to me through Fortuna, I would spend a lot of time talking with him about why these schools and, and probably um, uh, trying to, to persuade him to consider INSEAD because I think that with a little bit of a, a, a increase on that quant in particular in the, in the GMAT, given his international experience, which is not necessarily obvious on, on this slide, but in his CV, um, and, and the global nature of his, um, his community service and extracurricular as well, um, I think that would be a school that would be worth him considering. Right, and, and mm -hmm. also the, presumably the opportunity cost for a, an entrepreneur, a one-year program that enables 100%. him to yeah. get back and yeah. scale that company that he has. So INSEAD sort of talks about a, a quasi-formal mm. um, minimum of 70th percentile on the quant. Maybe, uh, Mohit, you're talking about retaking the the GMAT, that will be a key part of that assessment. Um, I, I spoke earlier, Heidi, about a, a school whose tagline in Palo Alto is, you know, change lives, change organizations, change the world. There's always that temptation though for applicants to sort of give this big vision about how they're gonna, I don't know, kind of come up with clean drinking water solutions in sub-Saharan Africa, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, and, and when uh, Kirsten and the rest of the admissions team are looking through that profile, if they don't see clean drinking water, <clears throat> it sounded like uh -huh. a great claim, but, but it can fall flat. Now, how do you think that Mohit or somebody like him can then leverage Global Shaper uh, as it relates to the World Economic Forum? Well, I think, um, you know, he does have the experience. I mean, that's the thing is you have people come in and, and want to do all these kind of amazing things, but they don't have that background. And he has some legitimacy here in the things that he's done, um, definitely ed tech focused. So, it does give a bit of, um, 
you know, credence to what he, what he's saying that he wants to do. And then these, the global shaper, I mean, these, these big, these big, um, you know, the extracurriculars are all kind of supporting his overall story, which is, I, I believe, ed tech. So um, it does make it much more unique. You know, you have, especially if you're coming from an engineering background, you were working in tech, you want to do big things, or you, know, you want to be an entrepreneur. If you don't have something that really is supporting that in terms of, you know, you've actually done a business, which he's done here. I mean, it's, it seems like a small business. So I would like to see a bit more in terms of, you know, how far has it come? What are the accomplishments that they've had, um, you know, over the last, it looks like year and a half, year or so. Um, it's kind of still pretty new. Um, you would still want to see kind of a bit of, of an understanding of, of how that's gone, but he does have that kind of background that makes it legitimate. Um, you know, it's, it is a big issue. I think, you know, this what Michelle brought up um, about stopping out for a couple of years, you know, what's going to happen to this company. If his goal is to go back to this company and, and lead it, then two years um, in Palo Alto is not necessarily going to be helpful in, in keeping that growing. So I'd like to understand a bit more about, is that really his goal or does he want to go, um, you know, I don't know, join another startup or start something different. How's that going to fit in with the, the, the business school? Right. Perhaps just a final word on Mohit and Michelle, if I can bring you in for recommenders. Yeah. Uh, there's mm. often the challenge with entrepreneurs, you know, he, he, he started the business and, and so, you know, where, where might he turn? Um, in Mohit's case, he's looking at former supervisors, former uh, tech leads. What, what would you be looking to then sort of discover about Mohit from uh, individuals that have watched the earlier stages of his career? Right. I would want to see um, from them what they see as his potential. So what was he doing within his job? Did he step up and take responsibility? Um, was he leading a team in his former work um, experience? Um, and what did that look like? The skills that he acquired? Um, and really, how did he stand out amongst his peer group, which is really key, I think, especially now that he's stepped away from that and doing something on his own. Um, mm -hmm. And to really understand um, what he brought to that company, how he was valued by them. Um, and, if they, and that will be able to come clear to the admissions committee reading the recommendation letter is that they did know him well, you know, personal qualities as well. And they can speak to those with specific examples um, and stories to connect to that. Um, and really how Mohit, you know, brought something new. Um, like Heidi said, he has some patents. Like, what was he doing that was innovative? Um, you know, how did he stand out, you know, and his traje trajectory at that company or within his career, how he was moving within it? Right. So we all, we all picked up on the patents. Um, and, and of course, you know, with, the, with these competitive schools that Mohit's looking at, uh, every last detail, you know, could, could just swing the admissions committee's decision and you know, publications, awards, uh, recognition that you've had for work and achievements. Uh, but he's got to uh, go back and sign up for another GMAT test if he's going to be realistic. But Cassandra, you would um, encourage him to take a look at uh, INSEAD, sort of play off that international background that he clearly has, uh, and perhaps a, a chance at a school like that. So uh, I think hesitant for uh, his chances at the GSB, Harvard and Sloan, which after all are three of the most selective schools on the planet. Um, but you know, clearly some very uh, bright parts of Mohit's uh, profile uh, to then bring out. Okay, so we move on from, from Mohit to uh, Irena. Uh, Irena has an international uh, mix of schools. Uh, Cassandra, you're uniquely well qualified to, uh, to start us off with Karina as she looks at some of the European schools, but also the likes of Stanford and, and Columbia in the US. Uh, dual nationality and then living uh, in a third country in the, in the UK. Uh, she may have post-Brexit plans as well as post-MBA career plans. <laughs> Um, and she's been in uh, the hospitality industry for, um, it'll be eight years by the time uh, she would start uh, business school. In fact, Cassandra, you know, we saw with Mohit's uh, older applicants, if um, Irena will be sort of hitting 30 as she applies to business school, one of the post-MBA career goals that she'd shared with us is consulting. Now, if that was, she talks about a focus on logistics and, and perhaps the, the travel and hospitality, this hospitality industry, but typically as we look at, you know, many applicants, that see business school as this segue into consulting at McKinsey, Bain, BCG, and elsewhere, um, they're not typically looking for the 32, 33 year olds as they come out of business school. So perhaps any advice to Irena in terms of um, post MBA career goals, given uh, the, the already impressive background that she has? Mm -hmm. um, so 
I made a, a switch when I went to Columbia from obviously working in education to going into management consulting, and I was 31 at the time. So it's definitely possible. Um, I think you have to cast a, a wide net. So if you're only focused on McKinsey, Bain, BCG, um, that's probably not wide enough if, if you want to make the change. The biggest piece of advice, though, I have is not so much whether that's what the companies are looking for. I mean, she had a career gap where she traveled, et cetera, and so her age might not actually be um, really obvious to recruiters. Um, but what she needs to be aware of is that she will be starting at the same level and at the same salary as everybody else who they recruit from business school who might be 25, 26, 27. And so it's really a matter of um, whether or not she feels that that is an appropriate level for her and she'll be happy to work her way up the ladder from that point. Right. Okay. So um, it's uh, Michelle, you must have read many um, applications where people loved reading, uh, running, cooking. In, in this case, um, a lot of physical activity, runner, rock climber, scuba diver. And I know later uh, in uh, Rana's profile, she sort of backs that up with scuba dive master. As, as we're sharing all of those sort of hobbies and, and passions, um, like how, how can the reading, uh, cooking and running uh, sort of stand out and, and is it being able to take it to that next level and show that you've actually you know achieved a level of instruction in her case with uh, with paddy uh, licenses and scuba dive master to really reflect um, how the, the sort of progress that you've made yeah i think with hobbies and being athletic and enjoying sports it really is going the next step and step so dive master is quite interesting that she went the next step to get certified and take that time and obviously it was a true passion of hers which is very interesting um i will when people say they've traveled or I, I i want them to go to the next step and tell me you know how many countries how many continents where you know was a specific region um was it by yourself as she said she traveled by herself or Around, you know, around the world? Um, was it camping, you know, and, you know, giving, did you, you know, coach a sports team? Were you part of an intramural volleyball team? Were you the captain? Did you compete? Did you win any, you know, competitions? Um, I've heard people, you know, have really interesting like dragon boat races and, but really show a commitment to it and something that, and why was it important to them? Was it the team com camaraderie? <clears throat> was it doing something new um, to really get a better sense of who this applicant was and what they're interested in um, and enjoy doing? Right, right. Um, Heidi, in terms of recommenders, uh, one, one of the recommenders that yeah. I was thinking of was to go back to university and approach a professor. Often not the best strategy, right? Mm. Yeah, I think especially this far out, um, it, that would not be something I would recommend. I mean, it's just a little bit too far from what she's been doing, um, that person would have a hard time really speaking to her leadership potential, which is really what the schools are going to be focusing on in terms of, you know, what experience has she had um, as a leader? It looks like there's a lot here. I mean, you know, she's definitely done a lot of different things and had some leadership roles. Um, you know, maybe I would say, um, you know, a, a really happy, it's, it's a tough one because um, I'm not sure she says um, a head of procurement for, I guess, her current um, her current job, um, that sounds good, but then potentially, you know, I would look for um, some, maybe a really happy client. I mean, she's had some really big um, projects and stuff. So someone who can speak to how she is as she's working, how she's managing teams, um, some, someone like that would be much more effective, I think, than a, a university professor from, you know, two, 10 years ago. Um, right. You know, she has a very kind of very background. It's a little bit hard to, um, none of these are really well-known companies. I guess the Hyatt is, but you know, some of these big hotels, but it's really hard to, it's kind of a bit hard to, to understand her career projection um, over the last several years. I mean, has she actually increased in responsibility um, and how has, you know, how has she kind of grown in her roles? So someone who can really help us understand that, um, you know, that she has actually had increasing responsibilities, leadership roles, that these are steps up, not sideways. Right, right. Uh, now, um, Cassandra, with 92 nationalities in Fontainebleau, 65 in Regent's Park, and probably as many uh, on the outskirts of Paris at HEC, uh, you know, the, the European business schools really have that sort of um, focus on 
global mindset and, and, and international backgrounds. Irena clearly has that with the degree of travel that she's done, dual nationality. Will that then um, persuade the top European schools to overlook a 2.56 GPA? I mean, we're, we're well below even that sort of 3.0 that many of the US schools consider as a, a sort of a, a minimum. Uh, do, do you think that she can uh, leverage everything else that she's gone on to achieve in an international career? No. So um, the, the, one, the one and only way to balance out the GPA is to, is to get a better GMAT um, because it's a completely different category, right? So being international it doesn't, doesn't give the ad um confidence that you can cope with the academic rigor of the course. And so the only other point in the application that they're going to have as a reference is, um, is the GMAT or any other postgraduate work she might have done that, that maybe isn't listed here. Um, and so um, what I would see, you know, what I see is the international motivation for um, the European schools, it's your ticket to play. I mean, that's, it's just a requirement. You just have to have it, but it's, it's not going to balance out any other potential weakness that you have in your application. Right. So she's got to go and nail data sufficiency to show sure. that she can handle yeah. numbers, make up for that GPA. Um, either Michelle or Heidi comments on, uh, on GPA from a U.S. school perspective. Um, it's yeah, I, mean, I think it's, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a low, it, it was exactly what Cassandra said. I mean, it's the same thing. It's a low um, GPA. Um, it has to be counterbalanced by a high GMAT, especially because, again, she's not coming from, you know, a Goldman Sachs or a McKinsey, which would also kind of counterbalance that, that any kind of point problem. Um, so definitely the GMAT is going to be key here. Right. So perhaps the, she can use the fact that she's not from Goldman or McKinsey and brings you know, experience in sort of the leisure hospitality industry, the, so there's some professional diversity there. But um, Irena, we mm -hmm. think we struggle uh, with that GPA with the top US schools and, and Cassandra urges you to, uh, to really um, nail the GMAT and achieve that 700 plus score to, to give you a fighting chance and show that you've got this sort of uh, academic wherewithal to handle the program. So uh, I, I would also just, just as a, um just to build on that is I would also explain this GMAT, oh, sorry, excuse me, this GPA in your GPA. application. Um, yeah. You know, to, to, to acknowledge that it is a weakness, explain why you didn't achieve what you're capable of achieving, and then show that, you know, you've put in the effort and the work um, to get the GMAT score you know you needed to get, and that is a display that you can study and learn and, and achieve a better result. Right, yeah, don't, don't leave you, the committee, to sort of wonder about, you know, why that transcript, why that GPA, because otherwise the conclusions you might draw, and, and there could be a very good explanation for it, so uh, start uh, providing some context. Okay, I think uh, our next profile, Leo, um, and Leo, who's uh, been patiently uh, waiting on the webinar, now it's, now it's your turn, Leo, so where do you want to go to school? You've got a mix of sort of East and West Coast schools, um, and healthcare seems to be a, a thread, both in terms of uh, Leo's background as a clinical trials manager in healthcare, uh, but of course, uh, four or five uh, top business schools that all have core strength in the healthcare industry. And as the US looks at spending as much as 20% of GDP uh, on healthcare in the years to come, I think that pretty much every uh, dean and admissions director that we spoke to at the events that we ran through September all identify healthcare as one of the key areas that business schools will be engaged with uh, in, in the years ahead. So, uh, so you're in a fascinating space, Leo. Um, Michelle, do you want to uh, start with uh, Leo, some of the things that, uh, that you liked and saw in his background? Um, I liked his background <clears throat> in the healthcare space. Um, and he had an interesting mix of doing the, the clinical trials um, and also working um, at a, a free clinic, I think it was, I'm looking at his CV. Um, and very strong, I think over four and a half years, really dedicated to that space. And I think having management experience as well um, and having in-depth knowledge. So I think he would be able to bring, like you said, the schools are really looking for that, that deep knowledge base in his, his area of healthcare to contribute to classmates and classroom discussions. I thought was quite interesting and I think he could leverage that. Um, but unfortunately, with the offset it with, I am concerned um, with the schools that he listed um, with Wharton and Berkeley is the GPA and the GMAT um, for, you know, that academic piece. Um, if he really wants to be competitive um, with those schools applying, the GMAT needs to go up considerably. Right. 
Right, and we're talking sort of 720, 730 plus, right, to, to, to really right. sort of show that core strength. Um, just on, on that point, Michelle, in terms of healthcare, you know, it, the HCM program at Orton and, and a number of schools, you know, there's also Kellogg, Columbia that would uh, fit into that list that really have that sort of strength. Um, would that be something very positive as, as an applicant was looking to show why they had targeted a particular school, you know, to really sort of align their goals, their background and those post MBA career goals, with that core strength of the of the school that that really sort of uh, engages the discussion with you as an admissions committee right absolutely they have to understand what that school that they're interested in is is offering them what the fit is so you know if it's with healthcare what that school is offering what they need to gain through their mba so what skills are they lacking what you know what um is it a general management education is it you know the leadership aspect whatever it is and to really be able to articulate through the application why that school is the best school both what they would gain from it, but also I like to contribute as well. So bringing their background, but it's really to understand what that school's program uh, would be offering to them and where they see themselves going, um, and, you know, post MBA and how that's going to help them. Cassandra, we've seen enough applicants in the sort of the weeks that lead up to round one, round two, or rolling admissions at Columbia um, that sort of look at their careers in investment banking or sort of, you know, working 85 hours a week and they realize that they haven't volunteered. And there's this sudden rush to start walking puppies at the animal site, which, which is great. You know, the puppies need the exercise. Um, but there's this sort of ticking the box. You know, I, I, I need to volunteer somewhere. Whereas in Leo's case, it, it potentially it seems that it's been something that he's really sort of been committed to um, and gone beyond just volunteering, but also take on, on a leadership role. It's, it's, it's that next step, right, to really be able to show the sort of impact that you've had uh, in your community engagement and volunteer work. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a real feather in his cap um, for his application and also just as a human. And so it's something that I would, I would definitely recommend that he um, fully address in one of his essays. And if he doesn't feel that one of these applications gives him the opportunity to do that, I would use his optional essay to make sure that the, um, the committee understands the depth uh, to which he's been involved. Right. Um, Heidi at Stanford, I know it's not among Leo's target schools, but over 25% of the MBA students are pursuing some form of dual degree, whether it's a JD, a MPP, uh, you know, Kennedy School, but many, many different options. Now, in Leo's case, um, he's considering combining the MBA with, with an MPH, but perhaps I'm uncertain about that. Um, what is your sense? Does, does sort of bringing this package of MBA plus uh, actually appeal to the schools or can it sort of be diluted? It really needs to fit into a bigger sort of longer term picture of where he sees himself headed, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to make sense. Um, in Leo's case, I think it definitely does make sense. I mean, he's coming from kind of slightly, you know, academic clinical trials, all that kind of fits into, I think for me, an MPP would, would make a lot of sense. Um, you know, they, they will evaluate him on the basis not of the dual degree, but as, will he fit into the MBA program? However, I do think, you know, if you're applying to one of those at the same time, it just helps strengthen the overall story and the career um, narrative that you're, you're presenting. So, um, you know, you want to be able to talk about that in the essays of why you're, you're getting an MBA and how it fits in with um, your long-term goals, but, and an MPP can kind of help um, make that case. Um, I think in his case, again, you know, like um, we, uh, like Cassandra's pointed out, I and mean, he really does walk the talk. He has all these this this really unique background, which I think is very attractive. Um, and if he can overcome the GMAT um, issue, then I think that he can be a very attractive candidate. Right. We, we ran a story, uh, an interview with Kellogg a couple of weeks ago, where the admissions director Melissa Rapp said, "You know, tell me such a great story that I forget about your GMAT." Uh, but, you know, the data exactly. points still role. Mich Michelle had sort of, um, you know, zoned in on, on the GPA. Now, if, if we imagine Leo's case or another applicant that has exhausted themselves taking the GMAT three, four, five times, one option might be what? To try the GRE and see if that sort of delivers a different result. But is there anything else an applicant can then do in terms of online courses or just to sort of show both the self-awareness, perhaps, you know, to, to demonstrate their quant skills, uh, but also that um, willingness and determination to sort of, you know, ensure that they can then thrive in the classroom. What, what are some of the online options that you think might be helpful for Leo or any other applicant that's struggling with the quant section of the GMAT? Yeah, I think I it's think... the quant section. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I was going to agree with the courses. I have clients that definitely, they just, the GMAT is, you know, as good as it's going to get. Um, and they want to show that they want to be prepared, that they are showing them that they are going to be able to handle the curriculum. So taking, um, you know, statistics or accounting um, and having those additional pieces on their resume with the grade that they received. Um, um, as well as to have your recommender speak to if you've been able to show quantitative skills, you know, through your work experience to make sure your recommenders are highlighting that you are able to handle, you know, think, you know, with the crunching numbers, whatever, depending on what your background is, that could be another way to kind of help, you know, the admissions committee understand, well, you know, that you have had that experience, um, even though the GMAT score doesn't, ref isn't quite as reflective, in, you know, that you you know, reach that top number. Right, right. So exhaust every angle, provide you as the admissions committee with the evidence of aptitude yeah. uh, and, and that sort of um, determination uh, that might see you through. So uh, again, Leah, we think um, if, if you can bring that sort of a serious bump to the GMAT score, maybe 70, 80 points, uh, including a jump in the quant section for the likes of Wharton and, uh, and Berkeley Haas. Uh, but otherwise, I think the committee thinks you know, you've got a great story to share uh, and wouldn't want that data point to hold you back. So um, stay in touch and, uh, and good luck with next steps. Matt, also now, just, um, just as a just to just to reassure Leo a little bit, um, because we keep talking, you know, 70, 80 score sounds intimidating. What we'd be talking about probably is the difference between three or four questions max on the verbal side and two questions on the quant. That that's that would be the difference between you know, that over seven ten mark um, and and where he is now. Right, which can even just be time management, taking the test a second time and, and getting those extra two or three questions. Yeah, good, good, good point. Well, the next one, it could be uh, one of my twin boys. We've got Max from uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, and of course, thoughts of Amy's ice cream come to mind with this one. Um, from anybody else that's ever been to Austin, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, Max has uh, built his career in, uh, in real estate. Uh, and that again fits into post MBA career goals um, with real estate private equity. Now, very often, it, it, I'm going to step away from real estate specifically, but uh, you know, private equity, venture capital, the, these fields that um, many uh, applicants to business school would prize as they came out of one of the top schools. Um, but just specifically on PE, that's very much also based on what you've done pre MBA, right? I mean, the likes of Harvard, Stanford, Wharton. They do want to see a couple of years of investment banking or private equity if you're successfully going to secure a position like that coming out. Is, is, is it different in real estate? Uh, is there a little bit more latitude? And of course, in Max's case, with six or seven years of experience behind him working in commercial real estate. Michelle, what do, what do you think in terms of post-MBA career goals? Um, it would be definitely a discussion I would have with him because I do think his real estate background is quite interesting. Um, when I did read the, the private equity piece, I'd really want to talk to him just his understanding of what that is. Sometimes clients say they want to do something, but maybe don't really have a grasp of what that, that role entails. And like you said, previous work experience, even with the MBA. Um, <coughs> So I don't know, maybe uh, Heidi and Cassandra also have, you know, experience. The real estate's a little bit different, I think. Um, I actually have worked with a client that, but he did, again, like you said, had a little previous experience within real estate um, in like the iBanking, didn't go from a pure real estate background in wanting to do private equity. So right. you'd have to work on that story. In the case of Austin, Austin has been a booming, booming real estate market in the last 10 years. There's something like, right. uh, what the numbers, but 35,000 people moving to Austin every month, if not every year. But you know, so the town is growing. Um, it would be difficult not to succeed. Um, if, if we take sort of um, performance, trying to quantify performance, how, how can we show the business school that your contribution, you know, sort of um, outperforms the market, whether in real estate, investment, because, you know, if you're in a boom market, perhaps we'd all be doing well. How, how do we then show the schools that we really had that positive impact? Heidi, any thoughts on that? It's tough, um, especially, um, you know, you're coming from, from some of these. I, I, the, for me, for example, I don't know these companies. So um, it's a little bit harder to kind of benchmark against other people. I mean, I think that the recommendations are going to be really important in choosing your recommenders. In an ideal world, you would want to have recommenders who have either gone to the schools that you're going, you're applying to, or have recommended people before so that they can make a kind of a, a real comparison and, and really have a legitimate say that you are in the top, you know, three to 5% of your peer group. I mean, that's really what 
you need um, them to be saying is that you are the top performer and you are going to be doing amazing things. And therefore, you know, you deserve one of these few spots at these schools that he's applying to. So um, I think the recommendations are going to be really important in finding kind of the right uh, mix. Um, who's going to, they're going to both um, emphasize maybe some of the hard skills that come out here and the deals that he's done and the, um, you know, some of the, his, his personal impact. Because again, on some of these big deals, it's hard to really understand what his role was. Um, and so you want someone else to be able to speak to that, that he, you know, this deal maybe couldn't have been done without, um, without Max on the, on the team. And then secondly, just making sure that there, maybe the other recommender is talking maybe some more about some of the softer leadership skills, um, how he is in, 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 in a team, um, again, trying to bring out as many different sides to him as possible. Right. Yeah. And schools like Kellogg that really emphasize that sort of collaborative mm -hmm. team-based approach. Cassandra, might, might Max be missing a trick by approaching the two MDs at his current company? Would, would you want to see more breadth or, you know, just the fear that they, they sort of needlessly overlap one another uh, with the sort of insights and perspectives that they share? Yeah, I think that's really individual. So it, it, I think it depends on the kind, you know, how closely he's worked with both and if they, if they can complement one another or if they're just going to regurgitate the same things. So I think, you know, um, potentially rather than answer that question for Max here today, just say that's something that I'd want to talk with him about. And that's something to keep in mind is that you want to be sure that you're, the adcom is getting a 360 degree view of you. Um, and so you want things that are supporting one another. You don't want them to say completely different things, um, but they but they want somebody that's you know seeing you maybe in a different context or can um, can comment on on an area that maybe somebody else hasn't seen. Right, Michelle, I'm going to go back to extracurriculars and volunteer work again because we'll see uh, Big Brother Big Sister. We'll see Minds Matter, and, and and they're just sort of listed at the bottom of the of the resume typically. Uh, and here, Max plays this role with a local nonprofit and is, is on the board. Uh, again, just in Max's case or any applicant to business school to really make sure that you as an admissions committee uh, understand what that board role means and how he's had positive impact, right? So not just confining it to four or five short words at the bottom of a resume. Right, is to give the description, what have you done with the local non, you know, profit board? What impact, like you said, what impact did you make? Were you on, you know, were you working on a certain project for them? Or, try, you know, what were you trying to help them with? Did you, you know, are you able to quantify that or tell us what kind of impact you made, you know, by sitting on that board? And I want to understand that connection to, you know, why he had chosen that board and how long has it been that he, like you said, is it something recent or is it something he's been doing since he graduated or within the last couple of years? I will say that Max had a very, um, looking at his CV, a strong, um, you know, a community involvement um, background. Um, he was um, selected for this leadership development program in real estate. I think it was a year program. I believe he was an Eagle Scout um, and really a lot of leadership, which I really like to see outside of just work. Um, I'm a big fan of the Eagle Scout. You don't see many of those anymore. Um, so I think that really shows that he has a commitment to what he chooses to do. And he has chosen to do quite a, quite a few things. Um, so that is really going to help strengthen his overall, you know, um, candidacy, um, along with his strong, you know, real estate background, etc. But there was a lot of big, a lot of leadership as well there. But you really need to be able to speak to, like you said, what specifically have you done within, you know, Minds Matter, Big Brother, the mentorship, and why is it important to you? I want to understand that if I'm reading an application. Right, because mm -hmm. you guys in the admissions, you, you were doing a lot of detective work, right? Trying to join those dots and see patterns of behavior, whether it's patterns of leadership or patterns of innovative thinking. So, so you're sort of looking at volunteer work and see how that might then sort of um, you know, demonstrate that that recurring pattern uh, through the, the role with the board um, or in his current day job, right? So, so always looking for patterns of behavior. Yeah, and I think, um, it, you know, it, the thing that's nice about this resume is especially kind of supporting that PE argument uh, or that goal is, you know, he's going to need to have a really extensive network. And so he does, you know, he has been very involved. I mean, again, the career vision is going to be really important. Does he want to go back to Austin? If so, that makes, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense because he has obviously a very extensive network there. Um, and that makes that PE piece um, more believable um, that he has, you know, not only done well at work, but, you know, the Real Estate Council, um, Urban Land Institute, those are all kind of professional organizations that will help 
um, support this argument that he's making. I right. Think. So good, 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 good candidate. Um, I guess uh, on home turf, he, you know, good GPA from a great school, and McCombs, McCombs might need convincing that you know they really are his his top choice. But um, uh, demonstrating those patterns of leadership to HBS. Um, you know, how a school like Wharton, with again great strength in real estate, sort of aligns with his goals, and perhaps making the most of a an applicant initiated interview at Kellogg to get in front of them. You know, it's one of the few schools that does let you interview um, irrespective of, of the application um, and sort of join in that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview setting. So Max, good luck. Uh, I think you've got a great profile, good story to share. Okay, we've got two more. Uh, Sam, Sam is uh, self-employed. Oh no. No, it's not oh. Sam. It's bringing joy to the world, uh, or at least joy to the world. <laughs> um, never, never far away. And uh, an exec MBA profile looking at Wharton West, the campus that we have in San Francisco, um, has 13 years of experience worth cooking in healthcare and hospital management uh, and an econ background at Berkeley. So presumably there'll be a few courses in the transcript that show quant skills, um, has the option of either taking the GMAT or GMAC now provides an executive evaluation as an alternative. Um, so, uh, Michelle, this is Wharton Territory. I'm going to uh, let you go first with Joy. Yeah, Joy had an interesting background. Um, I mean, she definitely has, has had an upward trajectory um, now being the finance director at Healthcare Company. Um, and looking at Wharton at this, in the San Francisco campus is to really get to know it. And I mean, she's there, so to be able to visit and understand what they are offering to be able to articulate what are her goals and how the executive MBA program in San Francisco is going to really help her. Because um, I think she has a lot to bring, again, to contribute with her background in health care. Um, and so um, really to do her homework on the school, especially. Um, so I did find her to be an interesting candidate. I think you'd want to, you know, go through her story. And again, what has she, has she been able to work on the projects, um, the impact she's had um, at that company to really help her stand out amongst the applicant pool. But again, to have her really understand what the program's offering so she can, you know, and understand what they're looking for as well in the executive program. Right. Now, we, we, talk, we had another applicant with a 3.22 GPA, so basically pretty much the same GPA, um, and we're advising, you know, a strong GMAT score um, to apply to the full-time MBA program at Wharton. Cassandra, a slightly different story for the exec MBA, because, of course, we're drawing on so much more uh, professional experience. In Joy's case, she'll have 13 years, right? So that, talk us through how that sort of balances out and how she'll be able to leverage that in her application. Yeah, I, so I think there's two, if we're going to compare, you know, I think there's, there's um, two things to compare. So one is EMBA versus MBA. And so you rightly point out, you know, 13 years of experience, um, that, that undergrad was so long ago, you have a lot more to draw upon. Um, and in general, I think, you know, the more senior you are in terms of the class, they, they appreciate that you can't spend maybe as much time preparing for the GMAT. And so there's just a little bit less, um, less weight on that. I think also the quality of her undergrad, you know, a, an economics yeah. degree from UC Berkeley 3.2 is really quite good, you know, as maybe opposed to a, a, an easier degree or a school that we, we don't know about. And so I think you have to look at the, both of those things in context. Right. I mean, to, to how do the schools kind of keep up with, you know, we've talked for the last 10, 15 years of sort of grade inflation. Um, presumably you're looking at applicants from so many institutions, not just domestically in the US, but of course from around the world. So how do you keep up with, well, you know, Georgetown uses a, a sort of um, a graded, um, you know, a, a, a curve in terms of their grading systems or this school only allocates, you know, 5% will get anything close to a 4.0. How do schools keep up with, with grades and institutions? Mm -hmm. A lot of applications will ask you what, you know, where you ranked in the class as well. So to, to you know, to understand that. Um, and, and I think, you know, all things considered, uh, and, and actually, you know, Heidi and um, Michelle, maybe you can comment on whether this is as true for the US schools, but I would say that that's one of the reasons that the GMAT is so important um, because it is really difficult to aggregate around the world, you know, what different scores exactly mean. Of course you get used, you know, you, you see a lot and, you, and so you, you know a lot, but, um, but the GMAT is, for all of its imperfections, it's one test that everybody has to take uh, at the same standard, same level. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Right. Like it or love it, we have to live with it, right? So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and it is a standardized test that, that it rewards um, just uh, with, with joy, uh, various volunteer roles and local events. Of course, the tragedy of the fires that um, that scorched through Napa uh, recently. Uh, schools like the idea of, how, you know, you're not just watching this on the news, but maybe saying, well, what can I do? How, how can I help you know, people that possibly have lost, lost their homes or that this is something that um, uh, that uh, admissions committees will be very enthusiastic about, Heidi, right? Definitely. I mean, you know, again, it's, it's all about making, um, <clears throat> walking the talk. So if you're, if, if you want to show that not only are you, are you, you know, competent in your job and, and in this, in the case of Joy, I mean, she's had a great pre career trajectory. I mean, she's definitely increased in responsibility. That's very finance or oriented out, although in the healthcare space. So those two are really nice, but to have the, um, the additional part of, of, you know, community involvement, showing that leadership outside of not only your work, but um, in your community, um, being a part of, you know, something outside is, is definitely very attractive. Right. And she also has the resounding support by the look of it from her company, which, which, you know, yeah, even if they're not paying for it, the, schools, the executive MBA programs still want to see that they're going to give you the time to follow a program like this and perhaps uh, on a fast track. So thumbs up for Joy. We, we, we think uh, she's got every chance with um, securing yeah. a place in the West. Great. Now let's see if uh, if Sam is is the next one on my list. No, it's JP. I must have an old list. So uh, JP, uh, don't worry. Our, our committee knows all about you, even as I discover. Uh, so senior manager in consulting, looking at uh, two or three of the top US schools and then LBS, uh, another two year program, of course, out of Europe uh, and making that transition to a McKinsey Bain BCG. Certainly has the numbers of 760 GMAT uh, and, and strong GPA from Queens, one of the uh, best respected uh, institutions in uh, in Canada. So, uh, Michelle Wharton's on the list. Um, what, um, what what do you see in JP's profile? Um, JP is, is already a senior manager in consulting. So, um, when I see that, I'm a little. I would want to understand again the program. Is it why the full time MBA and looking at McKinsey Bain BCG? Where do you see yourself? Like when they recruit from business school, you're going in as a consultant. You know, so is that state taking a step back for him? Um, you know, maybe is an executive program something that might be more, you know, aligned with his work experience? And I'd have to dig into that a little bit more um, um, in his exposure over the last seven years. Um, so that is just something that's a little bit, you know, concerning to me because you have to tell the story, of, again, um, that they, you have a good work experience, but is a Bain McKinsey BCG going to, they're going to question why you'd want to come in as, you know, a lower level that you already were at. I mean, Cassandra had pointed out before, I mean, you know, how much you're getting paid, you know, who you're surrounded by your, in, in your title. So that's, I feel like that's taking a step back for JP. Right, right. Uh, now, JP, just uh, in terms of other information and context, so legally blind, uh, but hopefully surgery that's going to uh, reverse that condition. Um, placing that it seems um, awkward almost to just put it in a miscellaneous category because it, it must you know, have such a, an impact. Um, what will schools do with information like that, Cassandra, in terms of um, whether it's mobility or in this case, uh, JP and, uh, and his site? How, how do they contextualize that, you know, given just how well he's done academically, uh, how engaged he is in the community, obviously professionally very successful? I love the way you phrase that question, uh, Matt. How will they contextualize it? And what I would say is that they won't contextualize it. You have to contextualize it for them. And so, you know, if, if we were working with JP, I would want to spend a lot of time with him um, understanding what he's learned from that, what he had to overcome, how it's impacted his life, how, in what ways it's influenced him and his communications with others. And those are the kinds of stories that we would want to bring out throughout his application so that the admissions committee did have that context. Right, right. It's, um, and, and then in, in, in all of that, house renovation, which seems one of those quirky ones. I'm sure that uh, Lily would welcome me to be a little bit more proactive on some of our house renovation projects. Um, <laughs> that's something, Heidi, that, that sort of would, might bring a smile to the, to the admissions committees. You know, just something that, uh, you know, it's not all about higher sort of high performance and achievement in the workplace or, you know, renovating a home. Is, would, would that uh, come across well? I, I, yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, again, it, it, it's all about the context of does that just mean he tinkers on the on the weekends on his own house or has he done some serious 
house renovations um, that, and you know, it looks like I'm just looking here that, um, it, well, it doesn't really come out so much in his resume, but you know, what has he actually done with that skill? That's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I think the whole, here there's a lot of really interesting points. I mean, he's got, um, you know, just very, uh, he's done a lot of different things, um, has been successful. Um, I do agree with Michelle that it's, you have to really kind of put it into some context of what is the, the post career goal. If it's MBB, I'm not sure I'm really buying that, or I need to understand a bit more about why, why he feels he needs to do that. I mean, there might be some other possible career goals that would fit better. Um, but all these different pieces, um, make a, for a really interesting candidate and make me want to know more. And that's really what you're trying to get out in the application is that the, the AdCom really wants to know more. They want to invite you to the interview to understand a bit more about what makes you tick, where you're coming from. And all these different um, little tidbits are, are, you know, putting together a really unique which, uh, profile, which I think is, is what you're really trying to do to stand out among the, the crowds there. Right. Right. So clearly he has the data points, he has the academic vitality and Cassandra's yeah. point about you know, make make your case. Help the help the schools to understand for a particular physical condition that you have. Uh, but you know, uh, you all come back to uh, sort of the importance of uh, the coherence of those post MBA career goals. So um, clearly, that's something JP mm -hmm. uh, think about. So you know, feel free to uh, to reach out to us to uh, discuss that as perhaps you're looking at round two and all of those deadlines in early January. Um, as we approach the end of the webinar, we've got one more. I think uh, Vipul is our last one, and th then we're on a hard stop at, uh, at um, what is it going to be, 10 a.m. Uh, on the East Coast. Um, so Vipul, who is targeting LBS in SIAD uh, and three or four of the top schools in, in the U.S., not an HSW combo, but other great schools in the top 10, top 12. Uh, he's been uh, working in telecommunications, again, around seven years. That's been our profile today, right? Six, seven years of experience. Um, and looking to use the MBA to start his own business. Uh, coming out of one of the uh, institutes of tech, I guess, an IIT in India, um, and I think comments about the GMAT are going to be the same from earlier on with, uh, with Mohit, that that Indian engineer background, a 680, is just not going to cut it at any of those schools. So I'm going to um, perhaps skip that discussion with the committee um, and see um, uh, Cassandra, with LBS and INSEAD on this background, what would you be looking for uh, from Vipul to really get you excited about his profile? So the, the one thing that, that stands out to me um, as lacking <coughs> is um, international experience and international motivation. And so um, I would say that there's a subtle difference in how INSEAD and London Business School look at these. Um, I have personally never seen a candidate be successful in the application to INSEAD without um, a, a pretty good, significant um, international experience already. Um, although it is rare for, for somebody to go to LBS without that experience, I have seen them be successful in the process um, if they're able to make the case why they want to gain that experience and why they're going to LBS. Now that doesn't mean that there's nobody that's been successful without it at INSEAD, it's just I, I have personally not seen it in my time. So. Um, so that would be my, my first uh, question for NCAA and LBS is, is why are they on the list? Are they, they just top schools or is there, is there a really compelling narrative for why they need the international exposure? Right. I mean, I think that's true, you know, for, um, Heidi from your experience with Stanford, Michelle with Wharton, obviously two schools that rank incredibly well. Ranking isn't enough, right? The schools really want to feel whether it's Darton and the quality of their uh, case study and, and, and teaching. Um, you know, Duke we talked about earlier. I mean, Michelle, could, could you tell when an applicant was really um, just applying because of the school's brand rather than a, a deeper sense of alignment? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and, I especially, and I especially think now with what the essays are, let's say this year, is that first essay, they are asking you to tell them specifically what about Wharton, you know, is going to help you achieve your goals, right? So you need not just say it's the top business school or, you know, I mean, or fi me, top finance school, right? And just pick one little thing that you could read on there, you know, from something you know. You have to really dig deep. You have to look into classes, the curriculum, professors, Research projects, the clubs, 
Um, like if you go back to the healthcare, you know, the healthcare management program, the healthcare association, they put on a conference, I want to get involved, like really have to dig into that school um, and have specifics. Um, one comment I would make when I was reading applications was, you know, just generic, you know, reasons why and Wharton MBA, like I want to know that you want to go there. I mean, Wharton wants people you know, you know, professionally and personally that are really well-rounded, but to get involved. So tell me why, where you see yourself fitting in with, for Wharton at that school or at another school, what you, where you see yourself getting involved, learning, et cetera. Like you really have to give them that clear vision that you see yourself there and how you're going to benefit from it. Right. Now perhaps Vipul has been a, a ambassador for um, getting more women into, into tech uh, a, a sector that uh, typically struggles with, um, with sort of gender balance. Um, uh, Heidi, we can look outside of community. If, if you've had um, a particular project or an activity within work that, that still sort of expresses that extracurricular things that you're really passionate about, that, that can be just as powerful um, as a third party organization uh, that's in the community, right? Yes, absolutely, especially if it's a leadership role and especially if the organization or the, um, you know, the, the group that you're representing is, is a large group. Um, you know, I've seen people who've done, you know, in, within large organizations, you know, leading big um, conferences or um, large groups where they have to coordinate a lot of uh, people. So it's, it is a, definitely a leadership role. I mean, I think the struggle I have with this particular resume um, for the schools that she's applying to is that you know, it is very um, engineer focused. I don't see a lot of other leadership here. And so maybe that's something that you would work on to bring out. So some of these, you know, these active roles as the tech women in tech group, um, those kinds of things will definitely need to be highlighted because if your job is focused on, um, you know, in, in a very kind of non-business role, um, you really need to show that you have that capability and that interest in your in your background and especially i mean I'm, I'm having a bit of a you know need to understand a bit more about the post mba goal because it doesn't seem to be kind of related to much of anything that she's done so that's going to be a really really important piece of this uh application is developing that to you know really down to you know what kind of internship will she pursue what kind of companies post mba do those companies recruit um how is she going to make those kinds of connections and how is she going to convince them that she's you know, wanting to take on a product management role or, or some other role within the kind of the companies so that she will be in the place to start her own business eventually. I mean, that's a, it's a pretty, pretty big stretch from what I'm seeing right now. That's something that would definitely need to be worked on. Right. So I guess as we wrap up, I think in Vipul's case, um, and this is true of any applicant, uh, if there will be LBS and NCAD MBAs in and around New Jersey uh, and certainly Cornell, Darden, Duke and Stern uh, in, in the tri-state area. Um, so connecting with those schools, you know, everyone has talked about really aligning, getting to know the schools, uh, but don't just stop at, you know, the first NCAD MBA. Find somebody perhaps that has shared that passion for ed tech. Maybe they were a president of the ed tech company at LBS. Mm. And so the sort of discussions you could then have with them, you know, will, will, will feed into the sort of um, insights that you three were all looking for uh, as you assessed an application. I want to thank uh, all three of you for um, uh, taking the time to have reviewed uh, these profiles. Of course, um, we have another couple of recordings from previous events and we'll be doing more of these on the road with uh, Centre Court, uh, in 2019, uh, but do get in touch with us. As you can see, there's a level of sort of insider admissions expertise on the Fortuna team uh, to be able to look at your profile, uh, your extracurriculars, your GMAT scores, GPAs, what you're achieving professionally and how that might fit on the next uh, steps to business school. So Michelle, Cassandra, Heidi, thanks very much for uh, sharing this committee session together. Um, and all of you, we uh, look forward to staying in touch as you take next steps towards your MBA. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.